So hello everyone. We are back with another EasyChem chat. I have the pleasure today to welcome uh, Mathieu Legrand from France to US, the University of San Francisco, California, uh, working in the department uh, in division critical care in the Department of Anesthesiology. Uh, Mathieu is expert in several fields, but today we will talk about uh, management of oliduria. How are you, Mathieu? Is it everything yeah. okay? Everything good. Thanks, Fabio. Thanks for the invitation. Do you like the topic? Very much. Okay, that's great. So the first question <laughs> I have for you is, what does oliguria mean to you and how you define oliguria in clinical patients? Um, so, you know, oliguria is one of the key uh, uh, physiological parameters we, we measure and, and we, we actually, we, we care a lot in ICU patients. So um, it's, it's, it's like minute pressure, like... Uh, consciousness is really one of the key factors we we keep a very close eye on uh, in our in, in our critical ill patient. So, uh, the, the 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 standard definition it's it's you know urine output below 0.5 meter per kilogram per hour for at least six hours. Um, so we get because we know we have transient uh, time of oliguria. Even you and me, you know, um, a bit thirsty at the end of the day, we're oliguric for sure. So. Um, oh, so the the one to hour, what yeah hour to hour uh, change in urine output um, if, uh, if is kind of physiological, but a most sustained uh, oliguria is uh, is clearly and to your question what it means for me it's 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 it's, it's a red flag. A patient with oliguria uh, it's a red flag that the patient uh, needs attention. Doesn't doesn't mean he needs fluids. It means he needs he need attention. And we, we need to understand why uh, why is oligoric. So one of the points, as you mentioned, is that uh, many people just uh, consider oliguria equal hypovolemia. And of course, we've been, learned, we've been taught that it could be hypovolemia, of course, because it's, as you said, physiological, or it could be a renal injury. So how you start in your workup to differentiate these two categories and how you try to understand the reasons why the patient is oliguric? So um, I would say... The context is, is key. The context of where uh, where is the patient now? What the the um, uh, what the clinical setting? Um, how long? If the patient, you know, of course, a patient has been admitted for bleeding or for a severe dehydration. There is not a, a, a big suspense here. You, you know why the patient is oligary, and and no no need to to have a very extensive uh, workup. Um, you know, the patient was found down on the floor uh, uh, after two days uh, with, uh, uh, with taking uh, diuretics and so on. You know, this patient is volume down for sure. Um, a patient uh, three or four days in, in the ICU admitted after sepsis or after big cardiac surgery, here it's, it's way more complicated. The, the chance that the patient is oliguric, it's much, much lower. And, and you know, and the balance um, and the benefit to risk balance between uh, giving fluid um, uh, or not, it's much, much more narrow than uh, the, the first patient. So the context, the context is key uh, for assessing oliguria. Um, so, yeah, Mathieu, let, let, let's start from the difficult part. So yeah. let's say we exclude the patients where, as you said, it's evidence, clear what is happening. So the patients with sepsis or after major surgery starts to be oliguric. And then one question would be, is this patient hypovolemic? And we know how hard is assessing hypovolemic in these patients. Which, which is your strategies to diagnose the reasons why the oliguria is there? So, uh, yeah. Um, so I would say, first, it seems obvious, but obvious things uh, work actually quite, uh, quite, quite often in our, <laughs> in our patients. And uh, I do first, Almost often, uh, always, especially if a patient is, is starting to decrease their output very uh, rapidly, um, which kind of unexpected, you know, patient was stable before. I do a bladder scan always because I mean, uh, having an occluded, um, occluded foley is, is more often that we say, it happens more often than what we think. And it's very, you know, I mean, you, you feel a bit dumped, you know, when you, yeah. uh, when you give LASIK a patient with a, who had a, a, a urine retention. So I, I don't like this feeling. So I always do uh, a, a bladder scan. Um, and then um, uh, I think in, in our patient uh, doing now um, a pocket, so ultrasound assessment is, is, is still, um, is still uh, very useful to get a sense 
on on which side whether more congestive i mean a patient clearly congestive with dilated ivc uh, a, 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 a portal vein uh, 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 congestion and so on this patient for sure doesn't need uh, doesn't need fluid um, and 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 will cause harm um, on the other side a patient for for which um, you have unclear understanding um, and it doesn't look obviously congestive um, I would have a low, still a low threshold to give to give to give free to do a free challenge um, in those patient 250 or 500 depending on how likely could be harmful to give fluid uh, because giving 250 or 500 once, to be honest, is associated with very little risk. And, and sometimes we can hear sometimes, you know, urine output takes time to uh, respond to a free channel. Actually, it doesn't take much. Um, if the reason was, or the, or was hypovolemia, you, you get urine quite, quite rapidly in the, in the bag. Um, so and the, the error then would be to repeat to repeat fluid boluses if the patient doesn't respond um, to to the fluid challenge. That that where we we cause harm to our patient. It, the repeated it's keep on the same strategy when obviously your first attempt uh, fail. Because here, of course, you will have very likely a um, um, patient being oliguric because he has true on, on, ongoing acute kidney injury, and here you will cause harm giving more fluids. So and, I. And, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Let's say that as we are very good now in focus, you have accessed the echography and there is no clear signs for a hypovolemia or hypervolemia. So there are, there are three other issues that, you know, with the evolution of the industry that I would like to ask you is, do you think biomarkers have a role? Do you think that looking at uh, kidney hemodynamics with echo Doppler as a role? And which is the role of urine analysis in these patients looking, you know, as correction of sodium or whatever? Do you think that you should do that or not? Yeah. Uh, so um, starting with um, with uh, Doppler. Um, yes, I think Doppler. I mean, if you have a dot, especially with Doppler for for venous congestion, I think it's very very useful. Like always, no one single biomarker, but integrating your your Doppler um, um, uh, signal. In your in, in the old picture, um, it's uh, it's it's um, it's uh, it's useful for sure. Uh, I think it's not always easy, um, but but um, if if we you can get the Doppler, um, the renal Doppler, or the portal vein Doppler, which is much easier, is is useful. The urine, I then go with the urine um, analysis. Uh, I would say for the urine biochemistry. Uh, I find very little utility because we know it's very poorly predictive, actually, because our, our patient has very complex, um, uh, complex uh, hemodynamic profile, very often renin angiotensin aldosterone system activation because they're under stress. Um, and, and, and for example, the urine uh, sodium is very poorly predictive of fluid responsiveness or even um, progression toward persistent AKI, very little. Uh, so it's, um, it can be useful, for example, sometime when you have high urine sodium losses to find out why your patient, but in this case, the patient is a very, very rarely hypovolemic. It's not a problem of hypovolemia uh, or oliguria, but a patient oliguric, um, very, very little, uh, little uh, uh, use for my clinical practice, I would say. Um, Urine, then you, you can find urine cast for indication of acute tubular necrosis or injury. That could be indicative, but once again, doesn't really impact much your, mm. your, your first, actually, at least your first uh, round of actions. Okay, let's talk about the two last questions, the rounds of action. My first question is that when I decide to give fluids, uh, is the type of fluid important, which means do you give, for example, a saline bolus to these patients, or you say the risk of renal failure with 250 milliliters is higher than 250 milliliters of balanced solution. Do you think that at that stage, one bolus matters in terms of renal toxicity? Uh, so I would say, to be honest, one bolus, not. But as a sake of uh, mental health, <laughs> my mental health. I give, <laughs> I give uh, uh, balanced solutions. You know, because I feel that there is no 
there is no, uh, the, except, I mean, we put aside a uh, patient with TBI and brain injury and so on, but uh, there has never been an, an indication that, that giving a balanced solution would make, be worse than giving Cine. So my first line is always a balanced solution uh, because in the 250 or 500 won't make a big difference very likely, but you know, small action plus small action at the end might impact outcomes. Except of course, if obviously I know that the patient is hypochromic or hyponatremic when I start the, the, the action, but except those patients, I always start with a balanced solution. I have a last question for you, which is you give the fluids and it doesn't work. Is it any place or when you do a vasopressors test or a MAP challenge test, increasing blood pressure, especially for patients on vasopressors, of course, or not spontaneously hypertensive, when do you try this intervention to see the response of the kidney and how much time do you wait to see whether the kidney responds? So I start, um, I would say I would have a low threshold to start higher uh, um, uh, blood pressure targets if the patient is not responding to initial uh, resuscitation and especially uh, if the patient is known to be hypertensive at the baseline or have indication that he might need a higher uh, uh, mean pressure, for example, a slight increase in, in atra, intra-abdominal uh, pressure and so on, I would have a low threshold to start. And we know there have been uh, several physiological studies showing that increasing the mean pressure can increase in some patients, in some patients, uh, GFR, renal blood flow, and urine output. Um, but you're right. I mean, doing that, you have the risk of exposing the patient to higher than necessary doses, doses of vasopressors if they're not responding. So once again, urine output should keep up rapidly if you increase the miniature pressure. Uh, so you can give a try, see a few hours. It work. If it doesn't work, you can go back on on on, on a previous uh, target. You know. That's a very, very last difficult question. Do you think that the first choice should always be norepinephrine? Because we put on side the dopamine, of course, for the kidney. Do you think that vasopressin or other drugs may have a more physiological action, increasing renal blood flow than the other norepinephrine? Uh, that's a, it's a complicated one. It's a very complicated one. Um, I would say um, for most patients, yes. Norepinephrine, I would... Uh, uh, I, 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 I would say would be my first choice. Um, that's true, vasopressin might increase the renal blood flow and the, uh, the GFR actually, not the renal blood flow, but might increase the GFR. Uh, but there's still rather low evidence it impacts uh, uh, outcome. And, and, and if you take the all picture, it's still way more expensive than, uh, than norepinephrine and it's harder to titrate than norepinephrine for sure. So. Taking into account the uh, economical aspect, the practical aspect, norepinephrine would still be uh, my my first choice. Um, except, you know, we can discuss patients with a very, very, very rapid AFib or um, uh, a cardiac, uh, very frequent cardiac arrhythmia and, and so on. But in that case, uh, a patient with known uh, uh, primary hypertension with high cardiac output, uh, uh, in, this, in, in subset of patients, vasopressin could be a first option. I wouldn't say that for the for the majority of the patients. And that, if I may ask something, very important. I think you have you face a patient with oliguria. Hemodynamics is key; it's important. But you have to know to understand why the patient is developing oliguria. And when we mentioned earlier, you know, the patient has been here for three days in the ICU, developing starting uh, starting developing uh, oliguria or acute kidney injury. Uh, you rule out and um, um, uh, uh, urine retention with your blood scan. I mean, the patient is very likely to, de to develop a, a complication, very likely to develop a new sepsis, very likely to have uh, a PE and, 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 and venous conjection on a high right ventricular pressure. There is something going on. So that's always, always start to understand why the patient is developing your urea. There is something going on. That's a red flag. Thanks, Mathieu, for a very uh, very wise and kind uh, interview with us. And Thank I you very much. You, yeah, I wish you a nice flight back uh, to U.S. Yeah. Of course, I hope to see you soon in person or uh, to another EasyChem chat. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye.